We'll next hear from Peter Vestere from the, unit, from the Lutheran School of Theology at Chicago in Hyde Park. And he will be returning us to the theme of power and politics in the earthly realm. Thank you very much. I appreciate uh, the invitation to be here <coughs> and uh, be part of this, uh, of this unique conference. My paper is entitled Power and Politics, Incursions in Luther's Theology, and I will try to explain what I meant by incursions later on. Uh, uh, after listening to Christiani earlier, I must say that already the first paragraph of my paper that I'm going to present should be nuanced, but I'm going to read it as I wrote it originally. The so-called Two Kingdoms Doctrine <clears throat> has dominated much of Luther's research on power and politics since the early 1930s, and it continued being discussed through the middle of the 1970s. During this time, it was one of the most debated issues in Luther's theology, said uh, Borkham. And Gerhard Ebeling says that the doctrine expressed nothing less than the fundamental problem of all theology. However, for the last three decades since 1980, uh, there is almost a complete silence regarding the doctrine. The two kingdoms born as a doctrine in the 1930s had a short life. Did the concern about uh, politics and power in Luther's theology fade accordingly with the malaise that brought to Nath a once famous and highly debated doctrine? Does the featuring, uh, featuring of this topic in this conference indicate to the contrary? The answer, I think, is a qualified yes. <clears throat> Qualified it is because the topic is not the same as it was raised before. The two kingdoms doctrine and the way in which it tried to address the question of power and politics reminds me of what was stated in a graffiti in the wall of the University of Bogota, Colombia by the end of the 1980s. And it says, when we had almost all the answers, the questions were changed. Indeed, the questions changed. If some decades ago they were dominated by the political option between socialism and capitalism, the Vende, the great change that uh, the year 1989 is the symbol of and marks the end of the Cold War, brought about other and ever more diverse issues that are on the agenda. For example, the growing diversity in the feminist movement, the same growing diversity in the gay movement that has uh, an, an, ac an acronym that is ever increasing. The last time I checked it is LGBTQ. Uh, and uh, this brought the relationship between gender, human sexuality, and reproduction to a new plateau of discussion. In addition to this, you can add uh, uh, immigration that Alan just mentioned, considered as one of the social markers of the turn of the century, particularly as it affects the traditional places where most of the Lutherans live in North America, in Europe, uh, in Central Europe, and in Scandinavia. And most of these immigrants come to find there a source of livelihood. Strict political refugees are among them a minority. While this is happening, Lutheranism is moving south to places where survival is often negotiated on a daily basis. In the last 50 years, the majority of Lutherans in, North America, in the North Atlantic axis have the majority, uh, the, uh, where the majority were, uh, went down from 90% to less than 60% presently, suggesting that the planetary south will have the majority of Lutherans in a decade or so. 
and that this will affect the Lutheran agenda and even bring questions not asked before to the Luther research seems to me unavoidable. And the questions are already, <coughs> are already being raised. We uh, raised and will be with, uh, uh, and they are within the spectrum of the issues that I have that have to do with human sexuality, reproduction, and sustainability, and livelihood. In short, they are all issues that pertain in one way or another to the household, in the broader sense of the term, to what was included in times prior to the emergence of financial capitalism and the Industrial Revolution, what Luther called the economia. And this brings us to address anew to Luther the question of power and politics, since the discussion about the two kingdoms uh, seems no longer catch much attention in the Lutheran agenda. My second point. Around 1530, Luther's more general references to the worldly, re world, worldly regime, Weltliche Regiment, becomes more nuanced. He had already been familiar and had used since 1519 the popular medieval division of society into three states or hierarchies, hierarchies, but it became most preeminent for Luther this division with and after the catechisms and this confession of 1528, and then it would go on into, into extended treatments in the commentary on the Psalms and on the councils and the church later on. And, uh, and uh, I am not using one single word to describe what this states in medieval society is because Luther is not consistent at all in the terminology it, uh, it, it uses. Just some for your example, for an example. Orden, Stiffe, Stände, Hierarchien, Erzgewalten, Fora, Mandata, and so forth. <coughs> Around 1530, uh, oh, in the Middle Ages, these hierarchies were often used in the sense of distinct classes or even social strata or rank and regarded as part of the natural law. The division of this estate took many forms, but they were all made in general reference to clerics, to the nobility, and to commoners. The idea was clear that these estates were discrete parts of the body of Christ as the natural infrastructures to its spiritual expression in the Holy Church. The medieval estates uh, uh, typology relied on the Aristotelian distinction between the spheres of the house, oikos, or in Latin domus, and the public order, polis, or civitas, to which the church or the clergy completed the tripartite division. In Luther's pen, this model while heuristically appropriate for his ends, underwent some changes worth noticing. For example, he does not see the clergy as a distinct class as such, does his criticism of monastic life, but includes all human, human race insofar as they are all descended, descended from Adam. He, uh, the preachers, but the listeners too, the auditories as he calls them. The same is the case with the household and the civil government. All become dimensions integral to the whole of the earthly existence or to what we now call society. The church is an instrument for the word of God to be announced to the whole of creation and is established in the Shabbat and the, for the human response to be expressed. So was the household or economy instituted to provide and it's, in their terms, nourishment, nere. While civil government was mandated for the sake of social order and defense, vere. These institutions are, by Luther, called larvae, masks through and by which God works as if through instruments. In his words, three states, here he uses stende, were ordained by God in which we live with God and good conscience. The first is the household, economia. The other is the political, politia, and, uh, and world regime. The third, the church or the priestly order. The distinction 
between vita activa and vita contemplativa collapses as attributes of classes, though individually one might be defined as more active or might more passive in each state, but he also insisted even princip, prince, princes and nobility were engaged also in the, in the economia. My third point, while the church is defined by a clear operational principle, it is the word of God, is the operational principle and criteria of the church, the same is not so easily defined in the economia and in the politia. And the examination of this is my incursion into Luther's theology. <clears throat> on the councils and the church, uh, uh, the councils and the church present a summation of Luther's understanding of these institutions and what they are to bring into effect. There are only two temporal governments on earth that of the city and that of the home. The first government is that of the home, from which the people come. The second is that of the city, meaning the country, the people, principles, princes and lords, which we call the secular government. The home must produce, whereas the city must guard, protect, and defend." End of quote. There is no question as to the reformer's own rather static understanding of these institutions. He did not know that the Industrial Revolution, for example, would move production out of the home. He did not know that the American and the French revolutions would do away with the entitlement, entitlement of, of nobility. But what we, he did recognize are two fundamental anthropological dimensions that cannot be collapsed. And the distinction is what really matters here. But what is their operational principle is my question. Their dynamic force operating underneath an apparently frozen husk of medieval institutions. In the disputation concerning man of uh, 36, in the initial 19 thesis on philosophy, Luther offers, offers a revealing interpretation of the four causes, famous four causes of Aristotle's, in which he flatly denies philosophy the capability of defining the efficient and the final cause for human existence. God is the efficient and the formal cause alone. Only theology is entitled to pronounce that because they belong to God's exclusive creating and consummating agency. But as to the material and the formal causes, Luther grants reason and philosophy some say. Even if only at the level of the appearance of things, in the case of the material cause, certificates is said. Or in the case of the formal cause, as something that philosophers dispute and will continue to dispute, dispute without ever reaching an agreement. The causa materialis, the material cause, is the one that presents the human for what they are, even in the midst of sin and of being a sinner, which means one's own production, one's own self-production, the way in which one brings oneself into self-realization. While the causa formalis, the formal cause, has to do, Luther said, with his speech, verbum vocale and with communication. It is about human public representation. Luther does not spend much time discussing these two causes in that context, but the distinction offers parallels to one that we, that we will find in the work and institutions of the economia and politia res, uh, respectively. But to find the operational causes at work and why did he use those two causes, we might need to go to Aristotle, with whom Luther was in fact more familiar than he and many of his successors cared to admit. At the beginning of the book six of Metaphysics, the philosopher distinguishes between three and only three fundamental distinct human faculties, dianoia, namely that which by motion causes production, poiesis, 
that which by the will causes a deed, praxis, and that which by observation or speculation causes theory, theoria. We shall leave the discussion of theoria aside in order to concentrate on the discussion between poiesis and praxis, directly pertinent to define the operational principle I am looking for in the economia and in the politia. The distinctiveness of poiesis and the verb poieu, in contrast to praxis, in contrast to praxis, a distinction that disappeared in the Latin West, is that uh, it designates an activity that results in, pro in production of something entailing an objective result while praxis conveys a deed done that has, that has an intersubjective effect but does not result in a positive and material outcome and describes human interaction in the life of the polis. The verb poiel, for example, is used in the Septuagint to translate God's creative activity, including the Hebrew bara, of which God is the exclusive subject in, uh, in, the, in the Hebrew Bible. From there, it made into the Nice Nicene Creed, which, which confessed the belief of God, poeten uranu kai ges, the poet of heaven and earth. In the New Testament, the verb is also used to describe Jesus' healings, economia, in medieval society, and also how Luther used the term entailed basically the domestic relations, which were in fact relations of production and also of reproduction. When the household and the economy in uh, when the household and the economy in the modern sense of the term share the same social uh, share at that time the same social space. It was in this institutional reality with its distinctiveness that the Aristotelian poetic faculty, as opposed to the politi political faculty, the praxis, was preserved. And it is from this background that it must be read and understand in my, underst in my uh, 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 understanding. When Luther employs the distinction between politia and economia, he intends to bring out the way in which these two institutions offer their own particular modes of cooperation with God cooperation with God, where God does not work without us, as he says in the, in the bondage of the, week, or the, of, the uh, of the will, but is carried out as though through instruments or masks. The metaphors uh, make it clear of instrument and mask, make it clear that for the reformer, the agent behind the tool or the mask is either God or then the devil. And the final end is accordingly decided. But the distinction between economia and politia is what is decisive here. And decisive it is because it helps to explain two fundamental aspects of Luther's anthropology, the human as a producer and as a political animal. So he insisted on the will of God is to discern orders, quote, Volteus is esse discrimina ordinum. Production and reproduction are not praxis or politics. They belong to different spheres or dimensions of our social existence. This allows us a qualified look into Luther's anthropology and thereby his view of power. More importantly, it establishes that the economic mandate has primacy over the political one. Politics is grounded on the economy, as we are going to see. My fourth point. If the distinction and demarcation is fairly clear, what is their relationship? Commenting on Genesis 2, 16 and 17, Luther says that, the para that in paradise, in paradise, unlike the church, ecclesia, and the home, economia, I quote, there was no government of the state before sin, for there was no need for it. Civil government is a remedy required by our corrupted nature, end of quote. Despite some, uh, some inconsistency in locating politia, some 
uh, some verses early, he already mentions the existence of government in paradise, but uh, the general view is not, is not like that. Despite some inconsistency in locating politia in relationship to the fall, Luther uh, usually held the opinion that civil government is demanded by the fall. Politics, as opposed to economics, is post-lapsarian. It means that politia, as such, even if mandated by God, is not an order of creation like the household and the Shabbat or the church. In, this, uh, 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 in the draft notations that he wrote for the lectures on Genesis, Luther wrote, at this, I quote, at this point in the history of the paradise, it means politics does not exist. It begins only in chapter 4. Where politics is not in place, neither is the need for medicine or such things. Politics is the guard of fallen nature. Economy is what remains of original nature. In his comments on Cain building a city for his lust of ruling, he says, Luther explicitly opposes it to the church. But what is more interesting there is still is that Cain exiled to the land of Nod, was sent off from his father's house, from the economia. Luther explained the difference in Genesis 2.14 between being driven from the face of the ground, and he quotes in, in Hebrew, Adama, from uh, where he had his own dwelling and home, his economy, that is, and being a wanderer on earth, Aretz, he quotes in Hebrew, Thus, the curse on Cain was threefold. I read, thus, one sin is punishment by a threefold uh, punishment. Uh, thus, Cain, Cain is uh, punishment has a threefold character. In the first place, Cain is deprived of his spiritual ecclesiastical glory. In the second place, the earth is cursed, and this is the punishment that affects his domestic, do, domestic establishment economia here. The third punishment, that he is to be a, wa uh, a wanderer and is to find a permanent dwelling place nowhere involves civil government, politia. End of quote. The point is that politia comes into existence when economia is affected by sin. The latter requires the former. While economia entails the self-expression in which the human labor produces and reproduces the means, and labor here can be taken in both sense of the term, in which uh, human labor produces and reproduces the means for the sustenance of life, from offspring to harvest, from the factory to, from the, factory to the writer's desk and pen, from the cook in the kitchen to the canvas of the painting. It is about the embodiment. Politia, how in, on the other hand, is the power of constraint to curb the effect of sin insofar as the second table of the Ten Commandments is concerned. And this can go from the discipline imposed to a child to waging war, from the work of legislation to police patrols, from the regulating international trade to codes of social etiquette. But the point is that all these structures for intersubjective and political deliberation are necessarily are necessary remedies for an economy that has been submitted to alienation and corruption. My conclusion, Luther uses of the metaphor of instrument and mask inter interchangeably to describe the earthly institutions or mandates uh, are suggestive of uh, distinct forms that a human self-representation takes, which ground the economia and the politia. Both are intertwined. The distinction remains, and one cannot be fully translated into the other. Hence, in order to understand the human in her most clear profile or stature, as Himago Dei, one must attend separa separately to her capability of producing and reproducing the means for the sustenance of life, or more precisely, being this very means embodied. 
which is conveyed by the word instrument, being the instrument itself. This is the most fundamental form that power has and is not fully transferable to the political realm. And when it happens, it is because human misrepresentation has already taken place. The alienation from who we were created to be, that is what we have lost. In Luther's term, economia, however, remains as a refugee, a, re a relic of uncor uncorrupted nature. The term uses as reliquum nature. The reformers insisted in finding Christ, for example, among the poor, the laborers, the little ones, ought not to be read in a romantic tone, but uh, as those who have had their labor alienated from themselves and therefore suffer the, the, the presence of the crucified Christ in the midst of their life, becoming an epistemological entry point to recognize Christ in our midst, as Luther has repeated several, several times. So that uh, the poetic mandate is the one that allows us to recognize once more the presence of Christ where Christ is in, uh, in, uh, in the midst of our reality. The triune God is the terminus a quo and a quem, the efficient and the final cause of this economy. In the interstice, however, between the two, Christ is indeed presence. As Luther said, as deep and as near to all created things as God is in them according to his humanity. This is from the Confession of 28 and is repeated at length in, uh, in the Solid Declaration, Article 7. <clears throat> he adds that we don't know this from reason or from nature. But from reason and from nature, we can see and witness this presence of Christ through which God works and the human becomes the cooperator of God, the cooperator Dei. And in this earthly existence, God operates through the human, through human labor and also through praxis. And only through humans, sed non operator sine nobis. This is why Luther can say that labor is in itself happiness, a quote. While politics is a function of the alienation of labor where unhappiness sets in. Politia, grounded in the praxis of administering the polis and guarding it against corruption, can therefore be exercised only on the ground of restoring the economy, labor and the household to its poetic function of human self-expression. Though the sword becomes a common trope for the way Luther describes politics and civil government, the actual formal cause for anything that happens in civil government is governed by reason, according to Luther, and guided by the goal of equity, equitas, billigkeit. The distinction that is now obtained between the homo economicus, out poeticus, in the Greek sense of poesis, and the homo politicus, is that the former is an instrument to be the work of the triune God, presents God's continuing creation in and through us. We are what we produce and reproduce, while the latter does it so as a mask that reveals God's judgment in a world regarding the perversion of this very economia. This is why the political sphere does not have an autonomy Eigengesetzlichkeit, we just heard. But it's not because it fails that he was accused, because it fails to recognize the lordship of Christ, but because its own norm is grounded only in the nomos of the oikos. And it is only for this end that it can be exercised, however complex and challenging to reason as this task by, may be. If it is politia that administers by means of reason the power relations, it is labor and the economia that grounds it. Therefore, without seeking the achievement 
of justice according to the intrinsic rights of the household, of labor, and of reproduction. Politics in itself is also distorted and corrupted. The mask of God is fractured and its fissures expose the unbearable sign of a hidden God that is at once also the devil's own self. Thank you.